Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the news hour tonight, deadly mudslides slam into Southern California, leaving rescuers to search for survivors amid the destruction. Then I sit down with two U.S. senators from both sides of the aisle to discuss bipartisan efforts to protect future elections against foreign meddling. 42 states haven't upgraded their election equipment in over a decade, and Russia knows it. And after being hit with extreme winter flooding, Boston plans for the promise of more storms to come. But will it be enough? In the future, when we have three feet of sea level rise, this is going to happen on, let's say, a monthly basis. So uh, this is really a, a snapshot of what the future looks like uh, if we don't get our emissions under control. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. They are still digging tonight in Southern California, where huge mudslides wiped out at least 100 homes early Tuesday. Authorities have confirmed 15 deaths. Another two dozen people are missing in a disaster zone that covers 30 square miles. Home after home destroyed, filled to the roofs with mud or ripped from foundations. I would say it's apocalyptic. I had no idea. That the, that the devastation was like this. Splintered remains and a river of mud now cover much of Montecito. The small coastal community in Santa Barbara County suffered the worst of the damage. People say they woke in the middle of the night Monday to the roar of a torrential rainstorm. It pounded some parts of the region with more than an inch of rain an hour. It sounded like a hurricane or a freight train coming through. I can't quite, can't quite believe it. Is that a house behind us? Was that a house? The deluge overwhelmed the nearby hills that had been burned bare of vegetation just weeks ago by the largest wildfire in California's history. Soon, fast-moving mud flows carrying large boulders tore through the wealthy neighborhood of 9,000. They had been ordered to evacuate, but many refused or left too late. I panicked. I mean, I, I, they were both asleep. Today, rescue crews kept digging through mud and debris in search of survivors. More than 50 people have been rescued so far. Many, including this family of five, were airlifted out, plucked from their rooftops by the Coast Guard. And crews from the Santa Barbara County Fire Department pulled a 14-year-old girl from her destroyed home in Montecito on Tuesday. She had been trapped there for hours. Robert Riskin was still looking for his mother late yesterday as he no searched through her home. It's my mom and I'm fighting with all my heart to find her. I've just been clawing through the mud and it's hard to hold hope when the mud is so deep. It's believed hundreds are still trapped or missing around Montecito. The storm also triggered mud flows and flash flooding across parts of nearby Los Angeles and Ventura counties this week, submerging highways and cars. Officials say there's no telling how long the region's recovery will take as crews try to clear away mud and debris. You're gonna follow my, my treads, okay? You got six to eight, 12 inches of mud out there. For now, travel in the area is near impossible. Parts of the coastal 101 highway are still closed, covered in several feet of mud. For more on rescue and recovery efforts in the flood and slide areas and how residents are coping, we turn to Sharon McNary of Southern California Public Radio. She is in Montecito and she joins us by phone. So Sharon, tell us, uh, thank you for joining us. Tell us exactly where are you? Um, I'm on Highway 192, which was that uh, dividing line between the voluntary and the mandatory evacuation. It's uh, just on the outskirts of the mud zone, and there's just a ton of activity going on here, including some military helicopters overhead. And what is it, Sharon, about this mud that is making it so difficult to remove? When you get a heavy rain on burned soil, the lower layer bakes hard and all the topsoil on top of it gets all this water in it and that makes it slow down. It also makes it sit as a very viscous, 
watery layer, and it's like the sort of mud that will just suck the boots right off your feet. Also, I'm sure that with 24 people still unaccounted for, they're being very careful how they dig. And Sharon, were people, were these towns in that area prepared for this? I would say that the government did as much preparation as they could, but they had so little time between the end of the fires and the beginning of the rain, it was probably difficult to put enough protection in place. The citizenry, people had the mandatory evacuation orders above Highway 192, where I am, below, it was voluntary, and people had been out of their homes for nearly a month, so you had evacuation fatigue setting in, and people might have taken some comfort that this is a evacuation warning, not a mandatory evacuation, and that might have accounted for some people being in their houses when it was unsafe to be there. And, and these people, as you say, have had so much to deal with. So, so perhaps they didn't take these warnings seriously. I think it's more that people are very unfamiliar with what happens uh, when you have a mud and debris flow. You can be in a place that looks perfectly safe, it looks kind of flat. You cannot imagine what it's like to be at the bottom of a funnel of literally acre feet of watery mud. And it comes very, very fast. I was in a mud flow yesterday, and it went from a wash channel being six inches of water to being 10 feet of water full of boulders. You just don't understand how fast it can come on you. So I, I don't think people were careless. I think they lacked understanding of how serious this was. I think really hard for people to imagine who are not part of it. And just very quickly, any estimates on how long this is going to take, this rescue and recovery? I have not heard one. I can't imagine it would be any less than, I mean, just days to dig it out. Well, Sharon McNary, Southern California Public Radio, we thank you. Thank you. In the day's other news, President Trump sharply criticized a federal judge who blocked his decision to end the DACA program. It protects young immigrants brought here illegally from deportation. In a tweet today, Mr. Trump said, it just shows everyone how broken and unfair our court system is. Federal immigration agents showed up today at nearly 100 7-Eleven convenience stores nationwide. They ran checks on employees' immigration status and arrested 21 people. U.S. officials say that it was the largest such operation since President Trump took office, and they say, quote, the first of many. There is word that President Trump will not reimpose broad-based sanctions on Iran, at least not yet. The Associated Press and others are reporting that he's expected to announce the decision by a Friday deadline. That is, despite his criticism of the 2015 nuclear deal. But the reports say he will restore some targeted sanctions on specific businesses and individuals. A new diplomatic effort on North Korea appeared to gain momentum today. Both President Trump and South Korea's President Moon Jae-in said they are open to direct talks with North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un. In Seoul, Moon said that Mr. Trump's tough stance led to yesterday's North-South talks and could yet pave the way to a summit with Kim. I think President Trump deserves big credit for bringing the inter-Korean talks. I keep myself open to any meeting, including the summit with North Korea, if it's helpful for an improvement of South-North relations or a settlement of the North Korean nuclear issue. In Washington, President Trump welcomed yesterday's North-South meeting and said, quote, who knows where it leads. The White House said that U.S. talks with the North are possible at the appropriate time under the right circumstances. Senate Democrats are out with a report that warns Russia is intensifying efforts to undermine democracy in the U.S. and Europe. It argues President Trump has offered no response and declares, quote, never before has a U.S. president so clearly ignored such a grave and growing threat to U.S. national security. We'll discuss election security with two leading senators from both parties later in the program. Another veteran of Congress says that he will not seek re-election. California Republican Representative Darrell Issa announced today that he'll retire after nine terms. He had once chaired the House Oversight Committee and was a dogged critic of the Obama administration. So far, 35 Republicans and 16 Democrats have announced that they will leave Congress or seek other offices. 
New York City today sued five oil giants over global warming. The suit named BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, and Royal Dutch Shell. Mayor Bill de Blasio said the city wants to recoup billions of dollars in costs related to climate change. And on Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 16 points to close at 25,369. The Nasdaq rose 10 points and the S&P 500 slipped three. Still to come on the news hour, two leading conservatives react to the fallout from the explosive book Fire and Fury. Bipartisan efforts to protect the next election after last year's Russian interference. A vulnerable Boston tries to protect itself from additional extreme flooding and much more. We begin tonight with politics. After holding a cabinet meeting this morning, President Trump joined Norway's Prime Minister, Erna Solberg, for a joint press conference in the East Room. The president took questions from reporters, but wouldn't say if he would sit for an interview in the Russia investigation without condition if special counsel Robert Mueller asked. It's a Democrat hoax that was brought up as an excuse for losing an election that, frankly, the Democrats should have won because they have such a tremendous advantage in the Electoral College. So it was brought up for that reason. But it has been determined that there is no collusion, and by virtually everybody. So we'll see what happens. But again, would you, would you be open to We'll see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion, and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. This appears to contradict what Mr. Trump had said earlier this year. In June, he told reporters that he was, quote, 100 percent willing to testify under oath to special counsel Robert Mueller about conversations he held with former FBI Director James Comey. In that same answer today, Mr. Trump also brought up the FBI's investigation into Hillary Clinton's email server. Hillary Clinton had an interview where she wasn't sworn in. She wasn't given the oath. They didn't take notes. They didn't record. And it was done on the 4th of July weekend. Uh, that's perhaps ridiculous. And a lot of people looked upon that as being uh, a very serious breach. And while it is true that Mrs. Clinton was not under oath or recorded, notes were taken and they were released by the FBI afterward. To sort through the president's remarks today, as well as a continued fallout from a scathing new book, I'm here with Matt Schlapp, chairman of the American Conservative Union. He also served as White House political director for President George W. Bush. And Chris Buzkirk, radio talk show host and editor of the online journal American Greatness. Thank you both for being here. We wanted to hear from both of you tonight. We've been hearing a lot of criticism of the president lately. We had former Vice President Biden on the program last week. We interviewed Michael Wolf about his book this week. We want to hear your perspective. But And I want to start, uh, Matt Schlapp, by asking about what we just heard from the president. How much is this Russia investigation defining his first year in office? Well, I think it took up a lot of the time and a lot of the coverage. Um, I think initially... The White House didn't exactly do helpful things. Uh, but I think as the year went along, uh, most Democrats I talked to, Judy, believe that there really was uh, no evidence that was ever presented or leaked. And by the way, this whole investigation, there's always been a lot of leaks. And there really there doesn't seem to be any hard evidence that there is any collusion. Most Democrats I know have moved on to trying to attack Clearly, his mental fitness, that's now the new theme. Right. They've moved on to these other themes, and they're hoping the special counsel can snag the president on anything. In the end, I think the American people are pretty fair. If he doesn't find evidence of the underlying charge of collusion, then I don't think the rest of it's going to matter. Chris Buskirk, has the president let this Russia thing get under his skin too much? Do you think? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, he's had to uh, he's had to sort of thrust and parry with the media throughout uh, throughout 2017, even into 2018. And there's been times, of course, when people have said, "Well, you know, he shouldn't have reacted this way; he overreacted that way." I think that's uh, that's not who Donald Trump is. But he, this is a an attempt to undermine and to overturn the last election. And so Donald Trump senses that he says, "I'm going to push back on this. This is not only an attack on me; it's an attack on the office and on the process." So I'm gonna I'm going to go back at this 
this full force. Well, of course, as you know, Republican senators, including uh, James Lankford, whom I interviewed today at the Capitol, say that there are real questions about what the Russians did yeah. Yeah. and that this investigation is legitimate. So yeah. even Republicans are saying that, is my point. Yeah, and I think people like Devin Nunes have been on this Russia thing since before the last election, and, the, and making sure that Russia is not doing things that they uh, ought, to, ought not do in our elections is something everybody agrees on. All right, well, let's move on to the book, Fire and Fury. What book are you talking not about? That, not that there hasn't been a lot of conversation about it. But, Matt, uh, Michael Wolff has some pretty strong criticism of the president from people inside the White yes. House, calling him everything from an idiot right. to a dope. Much of it's coming from Steve Bannon, but it's coming from others as well. Is it your contention that everything in the book is wrong? No, but the hard part is this. So I chair the AC, which puts on CPAC. There's an entire chapter in this book on CPAC. He never called me. He didn't call anybody on our team. He didn't call anybody else who was involved with CPAC. He has tons of factual errors in that chapter alone. He says that General Kelly has a job that he doesn't have. He says that uh, Secretary uh, Ross has a job that he doesn't have. He just gets error after error. And Judy, I think you have to ask yourself, even all the journalists who are covering it, which is if there's this many errors on little things, maybe he was also sloppy on big things. Well, I did talk to him. He acknowledges there are some errors. But his point is that the bulk of the book reflects genuinely, Chris Buskirk, what people told him after living. He basically lived in the White House for six or eight months. Yeah, that's the odd part about the whole book. I mean, leave, leaving aside the contents of the book how, was why he was there for so long. Uh, I don't think that what Michael Wolff was setting out to do was to do a piece of serious history or even a piece of serious journalism. This was a way to sell books. And so you make it as sensational as possible. And he said it in, his, uh, in the dedication to the book that, well, you know, I can't, you can't expect it all to be accurate. I'm just putting it together the way I understood it. Well, one of the outcomes in this book, certainly a match lap, is the departure from Trump world of Steve Bannon, right. who was the president's chief strategist. He was yeah. at the president's side. He was, in many ways, I think, the tribune of the meaning of Trumpism. Yeah. I think we're left wondering, what, what is the difference now between Trumpism and Bannonism? What, what's, and what now is gone from the, that, the, those voices around the president. Steve Bannon is a very talented guy, but over the course of the last several months, it has been painful to watch him make very big mistakes. One of the mistakes that he made here, obviously letting Michael Wolff into the White House, if he did, talking to him too uh, aggressively or too casually, uh, and, and in leaving the inference that he believed things that I know he doesn't believe in conversations I've had with Steve, he doesn't believe, for instance, that Don Jr. is a traitor. These are things that I think that either he was misquoted on or he got sloppy on. And so I think that when it comes to what conservatives and Trump supporters, where they are, where are their hearts, <coughs> they are very happy with what the president has done in his first year. And there's no separation. This will have no impact on the support of President Trump's agenda by those who, su who support him in the election. What do you think the absence of Steve Bannon means for President Trump? I'll tell you, I think that uh, I think that it strengthens Donald Trump's hand as president. I, this is Donald Trump's party. He won the election. And the fact that there's not going to be uh, what I've called an Avignon papacy, there's not an other power structure <laughs> that is outside of the White House, I think that's good for Republicans. It allows Republicans to have the serious uh, debates that, they, that Republicans need to have about policy and about ideas. That's good. But they always know that the head of the party is the president. But, but who now articulates what the president believes? Because one of the things, Steve, that comes through in this book is that Bannon was there, Steve Bannon was there to basically express a vision for Donald mm -hmm. Trump. That's not there anymore. Well, I've never heard Steve Bannon compared to a pope, so that was <laughs> but the But I also think it's a mistake. Donald Trump is his own best spokesperson. And I think people assume who don't think he has the intelligence or the political experience, they assume someone has to feed him these ideas. And, you know, I knew Donald Trump before he was president. He's been talking about these issues for a very long time. Nobody really feeds him. So I don't think he needs a guy like Steve there to tell him what to think. What he actually needs is people around him to help organize the process of government to get it done. And that's what they now have around him. Chris Buskirk, do conservatives believe Donald Trump is conservative? Conservatives believe that uh, they, some of, do, they do now. <laughs> Conservatives believe, though, that Donald Trump is doing something that's been necessary for a long time, which is updating what it means to be a conservative. Ronald Reagan did the same thing in the 80s. With, I brought in a set of new policies that upgraded the party. Donald Trump has brought in a new set of ideas and a new set of policies that still go back to the same principles, those first things, but is talking about the policies that are relevant in 2016, 17, 18. But as head of the American Conservative Union, Matt Schlapp, what do conservatives think about the president? He may not withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal after all. He 
He's going to Davos, Switzerland, to be with a group of people who believe in a lot of globalist uh, globalist philosophy. We call it globaloni, okay? <laughs> but so seriously, what I mean, who is who is this Donald Trump? It's the same guy. And the thing is, is this, which is Donald Trump can play in a lot of different milieus, and that was always well understood. The question is, can he be successful in politics? And I think where the conservatives are, Judy, mostly, is they felt like there had to be a lot of abrupt change to the order of things in Washington in order to have a chance to reset things. Um, and he's doing that and doing that effectively. They are happy with what he's done on Iran. They're happy with what he's done on climate change. They know he's going to hobnob with some uh, global elite at Davos. It probably makes them a little nervous. That press conference the other day in the cabinet well, room probably made them a little bit nervous. Well, I want to ask you about that because Chris Buskirk, the president, is there talking about DACA, the Dreamers, and he's saying, sure, we can do a Dreamers deal and worry about the rest of immigration later. And you saw the conservatives in the room saying, wait a minute, what about the wall, the border wall? Well, good for them. That's what they should have been doing there. I, I think uh, Donald Trump has been very clear, and he's, he's clarified some of those statements. He wants a wall. Right? There's, no, there's nothing that's more associated with Trump's candidacy than build the wall. That was the phrase. I don't think that's changed. I think that what he was doing there was a bit of political theater, but a little, a bit of negotiating, too. We've got to see what the final legislation looks like. And, of course, that's going to come from those very senators and representatives who were in the room. The conservatives in that room, it's up to them to write a bill that, that is consistent with what the president has outlined. Prediction from quickly from both of you, Matt Schlapp. What is th how is this second year of the Trump presidency going to differ from year one? It's going to be a much more orderly. He starts out the year with a team that feels like it's starting to hit its stride. They're working more as a team in the White House. They're working better with Republicans on the Hill. So I think what you'll see is less unforced errors and start starting off with some bipartisanship. But we're reading, Chris Buskirk, a lot of people in the White House and the administration are leaving. Yeah, no, that, that is true, and that, but that's okay. The key players are there, and the key player always, of course, is the one who's sitting behind the resolution desk. There are people who are now coming into, uh, into the White House. There's a structure there. There is order there that there wasn't there, there a year ago. And what's going to happen in 2018 is we're going to see people come together, both in the White House and in Congress, and focus on the election in November. I think that's going to be something that brings them together uh, and unifies them in a way we didn't see a year ago. It will focus a lot of minds. Yes. Chris Buskirk, Matt Schlapp. Thank you both. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. With primary voting set to begin in just two months, a bipartisan effort to secure the nation's voting system is underway on Capitol Hill, led by Senators Amy Klobuchar and James Lankford, Democrat and Republican. I spoke with them on Capitol Hill today about their effort, about President Trump's call for Republicans to take control of the Russia investigation, and about immigration negotiations. Senator Amy Klobuchar, Senator James Lankford, thank you very much for joining us. I first just want to make sure my eyes don't deceive me that there's actually a Republican and a Democrat sitting next to each other for an interview. That actually does happen more often than uh, is <laughs> captured by camera. It yeah. does, and even from Oklahoma and Minnesota. Right. So there you go. We appreciate your talking to us. Let's begin by talking about uh, the legislation that the two of you are backing, having to do with election security. Normally, Senator Lankford, uh, people think about ballots and how they're counted. It, it's mechanical. Uh, why is that a priority right now? It's a priority because in uh, 2016, the Russians tried to interfere in our election. Uh, we watched them try to be able to probe through different election systems, to be able to try to reach out to different secretaries uh, of state offices in different states, and to be able to determine how they're doing voter registration, uh, how they, what voting machines are they using. We should take that as a good fair warning, uh, that we should be aware that there are outside entities that do mean to do us harm and try to interfere in our democracy, and we should be better prepared for that in the future. So, Senator Klobuchar, what are you trying to do with this bill? We are trying to help the states to shore up their election equipment. This was basically a cyber attack uh, from Russia, and we know that. Um, our intelligence agencies have uh, very strongly, under both President Obama and President Trump, made that clear that they tried to get into our elections. 
uh, 21 states, including the two of our states. Uh, there were attempts made to hack the states. So what we do with the bill is this. First of all, better sharing of information. It's unbelievable to me that it took months for state election officials to find out that a foreign government had tried to hack in. So this bill says you've got to share that information, have someone designated in the states that can get this classified information, and secondly, giving them some resources to scan for vulnerabilities, to get the right election equipment, and also paper, back up paper ballots, which I think would be very helpful for a lot of these states. 42 states haven't upgraded their election equipment in over a decade, and Russia knows it. I think, uh, Senator Lang, for a lot of people here, paper ballots, and they think, wait a minute, that's the way it right. used to be. <laughs> right. uh, are you talking about going back to the way it used to be? People are thinking of hanging chads in Florida <laughs> in 2000. So there's a lot of varieties now. Uh, really what we're trying to do is say, we should be able to audit an election, that after the election is over, we should be able to evaluate. If there, we find out that some outside entity was trying to interfere in the election, everyone will immediately back up and say, did they get in? So there has to be able to be able to have a way to verify that. So it could be a paper ballot and an optical scanner. Uh, it could be a digital machine, as some of them have now that you punch in your ballot, and it prints a piece of paper to confirm, is this really what you voted? You push yes, and then it locks off a paper ballot, as well as your electronic. There are lots of ways to do it. We just, we're not telling the states how to do it. The states run their own elections. We're just saying there should be a way to audit an election after it's over to make sure that we can verify if they were attacked in a cyber means, uh, there is a way to be able to verify we actually have an accurate result. We're what, just a couple of months away from the first primary election voting in this country, just 10 months away from the general election, the midterms. Can this happen in time uh, for it to make a difference? No, not for 2018. Uh, that's the unfortunate part. Uh, there's a lot of work that's gone into it already to be able to evaluate uh, what DHS is currently doing to be able to work with states to be able to help them. Uh, we're encouraging them to have engagement now, which they have engaged. DHS has been very good about engaging with our states and providing whatever resources and help that they can in communication. We just think there's more to be done. But the states already have their election equipment right now for the 2018 election. They're not going to change it right before the election, but we can be prepared for the next presidential election and have it in place. And, and we can start cooperation sooner. One more point, yeah. That the two things that could change immediately if we can get this bill done, either in the omnibus or very quickly, would be one, they could get um, some money for screening for vulnerabilities of their existing equipment, and two, as James just pointed out, the sharing of information and just putting the stamp of Congress on this and saying, you must do this, you've got to share this information, um, and it has to happen now. But it sounds like, the bottom line is that the state election systems are vulnerable this year to Russian hacking or hacking from other countries. 21 states, I mean, that's a lot. Yeah, we, we don't necessarily know the level of engagement. Obviously, 21 states were probed. Most of those states, the Russians were not successful in getting through to the system. They were trying to get into the system. Oklahoma's one of those they were trying to get into. They weren't able to actually penetrate the system. The important thing is we're better prepared uh, and that we're aware that we're not just trying to be able to guard and protect security information after it's over. We have to be prepared beforehand. Our states will be better prepared the next time. We want to make sure, though, that they were actually better prepared. But not completely. Uh, safe from from interference this well, year. Well, and we know in Illinois they did get into the voter data, um, but what the information we have so far is that this didn't change votes, right. but they simply attempted to get into the data, and we don't want it to go the next step in the next election, and that's why, remember, while we're doing this, the states are doing a lot of things on their own, but this has to be a national priority. But you're saying this year states are vulnerable. States are vulnerable if they don't do the work that they need to do ahead of time. Uh, there are 12 states that cannot audit their elections, and that's one of our challenges. We don't know vulnerability. They may not be vulnerable at all, but if there's a question after the fact, they can't audit their elections afterwards to verify that. And we think that's very important. Russia, of course, big part of this conversation. They were the ones behind what happened in, uh, in 2016. They are still active. The president today is tweeting that the Russia investigation, which is connected to this in a way because it, it, the Russians ended up trying to help his campaign, that that investigation, he's calling it the single greatest witch hunt in American history. He's calling on Republicans to finally take control. In other words, get this over and done with. Um, first of all, I look at it as a truth hunt, um, and I'm, 
every time a, we get a question that starts with, the president tweeted today, there's a pause. But in this case, he said this before, over and over. So this isn't new news. He said it's a witch hunt, and I think it's a truth hunt. Uh, Mueller is someone that has been uh, first appointed by a Republican president, has broad support, uh, and is simply trying to do his job. And I think it's important for this country that we get to the bottom of what happened, regardless of what the president tweets. But when the president says Republicans finally take control, how do you read that? Uh, you know, I, I don't know how to be able to read that, what he means by that. I, I would tell you I serve on the Intelligence Committee. My responsibility is to not try to be a partisan on that, is to go after the facts on that. The facts need to go where the facts go. We need to follow the facts wherever they may go to be able to get as many of those out as we possibly can, to be able to run down every lead. Again, to be able to establish by the end of this some sense of bipartisan support. We've looked at everything, and this is where we are now. One other issue I want to ask you both about quickly, and that's immigration. Senator Klobuchar, the president, had a kind of a remarkable session at the White House yesterday. Senator Langford was there. But what I want to ask you is the president said at one point in that meeting uh, that he thought there should be a movement Direct to address DACA. This is the mm -hmm. uh, measures to protect uh, young people who came to the United States without documentation. That should be dealt with and then comprehensive immigration reform. How did you interpret what he said? Uh, to me, the immediate emergency is DACA because of these 800,000 kids that 97% of whom work and are in school in this country, and then you can go to comprehensive immigration reform. So I viewed it as a positive. It has to be done with border security. Uh, now, there, that, he, even the president yesterday said he's not talking about a 2,000-mile wall, uh, but there are sections of it that we should have authorization for, where, frankly, most of those are already authorized now. Uh, there are 650 miles of wall that currently exists that was authorized in 2006. Senator Klobuchar, is that going to fly? Um, I think there'll be some negotiation on border security. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there'd be something in there with border security. But this wall along the whole border, there's a number of Republicans who are opposed to it. There's issues with that. Um, but what I f found remarkable about yesterday uh, was just the openness to a discussion, but this focus also on comprehensive reform. Are we going to see more Republicans and Democrats working together on other issues? I think we should. We have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, yeah there, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of areas of common ground. My great frustration right now in the Senate is we're not voting on a lot of legislation. We're yeah. doing so many things on nominations. They're taking so long. We're not getting to anything on real voting on other legislative issues. There are so many issues of common ground that we have that if we had the opportunity to be able to come to the floor, debate it out, have a real vote, they would pass with 70, 80 votes. Uh, but it's just getting to that point that we can start getting us back to voting again. Mm -hmm. Pharmaceutical issues. The price of prescription drugs, issues with apprenticeships. There's just so much we could be doing, um, and I'd like to go there as well. Well, we appreciate both of you sitting down to talk to us today. But we won't talk about college football versus the Vikings <laughs> right now, but the Vikings are doing really well. <laughs> right. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, Senator Lankford, thank you both very much. Thank we you. appreciate it. Stay with us. Coming up on the news hour, voter rights come into question amid Ohio's voter purge and using cameras to see how animals like raccoons are impacted by urbanization. But first, science correspondent Miles O'Brien looks at how conditions during the recent cold snap in the eastern U.S. sometimes came together in unfamiliar ways and what one city is doing to try to cope. It's the latest installment of Leading Edge, our weekly science series. Surprising as it seemed, the experts saw it coming. An epic nor'easter, a full moon high tide, and a rising sea, all conspiring to swallow up swaths of Boston with an icy cold winter flood. It got wall-to-wall -wall live attention on the local news. This was the one rescue that they had to actually go through several hours ago here at Atlantic and States. I met Nasser Brahim in the same place on the Boston waterfront near the New England Aquarium. Water was probably right around up to here. Um, it was a little bit less than a foot of flooding um, at the station entrances. Brahim is a senior climate change planner for the engineering firm Kleinfelder advising the city on ways to defend against the impact of climate change. He says the storm was a classic 100-year flooding event today, but a much more common occurrence a century from now. In the future, when we have three feet of sea level rise, this is going to happen on, let's say, a monthly basis. 
So uh, this is really a, a snapshot of what the future looks like uh, if we don't get our emissions under control. For New Englanders, the term nor'easter is familiar, but this time a new moniker entered the popular lexicon. It's called a bombogenesis, and it's basically a bomb cyclone or a snow hurricane, snow cyclone. There's all kinds of names for this thing. That's Leslie Hudson, the digital meteorologist for the weather app MyRadar. Researchers coined the term bomb cyclone in 1980. It refers to a non-tropical winter storm that rapidly intensifies, specifically air pressure that drops at least 24 millibars in as many hours. Most common from October to March. So this bombogenesis making all kinds of headlines across the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic as is expected to dump a lot of snow. It's the result of a collision between warm air over the ocean and cold air from the Arctic. These types of storms are not uncommon, but there is reason to believe climate change may make them more likely to occur in the northeastern United States. Radley Horton is a climate scientist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. It's very early days in this research, but there's some evidence suggesting that loss of sea ice in the Arctic and extreme melting of snow in May and June in the high Arctic may be shifting the climate in a way that is weakening the jet stream and making it more prone to these kind of meanders. The jet stream is a river of air that flows west to east across North America. It is created by the temperature difference between warm air at the equator and cold air in the Arctic. Some scientists suspect that as climate change has warmed the Arctic, the temperature difference has reduced, causing the jet stream to weaken and wander. This would allow Arctic air to move farther south and linger there, creating the record cold temperatures recently in the U.S. The arrival of the warm, moist air from the south provided the missing ingredient to create a bomb cyclone. The other factor at work here in Boston is sea level rise. We've had about eight or nine inches of sea level rise since, say, 1900. That doesn't sound like much, but it's already leading to much more frequent coastal flooding than what you had in the past. And the sea level will continue to rise. The mid-range estimate is more than three feet by the end of this century, depending on how much humans do to curb the production of greenhouse gases. Even if storms remain the same, we're going to have much more frequent coastal flooding and much more damaging coastal flooding because of that higher baseline. Human beings have built civilizations during a 7,000-year period of unprecedented climate stability. But since the Industrial Revolution, the rate of climate change has far outstripped the pace of adaptation. Carrie Emanuel is a professor of atmospheric science at MIT. If the sea level rose over the next 1,000 years by five or six meters, it wouldn't be a problem. We wouldn't even notice. The problem, I think, for civilization is the high rate of change of the climate. And the question is, can we adapt without serious consequences? In Boston, they say they are serious about doing something to build in resilience against the effects of climate change. The concern is that we want to make sure that we can get Boston back to normal as quickly as possible. One of the solutions that Austin Blackman is chief of environment, energy, and open space for the city of Boston, 30 percent of which is landfill, built to stay just dry above high tides of the 18th and 19th century. So what does that mean for the 21st century? By the end of the century, we're expecting about $80 billion worth of assets to be in the FEMA floodplain. If you annualize what that risk would be, it would be about $1.4 billion worth of annual damage if we do nothing. They have drafted a plan to try and protect this low-lying city. Climate Ready Boston envisions strategically placed flood walls, berms, waterfront green space, and elevated streets. But cities can only do so much to fight something that is, after all, global in scale. I worry sometimes that we're creating islands of resilience and seas of fragility. Stephen Flynn is director of the Global Resilience Institute at Northeastern University. Where the real challenge lies is that cities don't control entirely their destinies. They rely on transportation, energy networks, communication networks that sprawl across the country, across borders. And so where it's so important to have national leadership, in some cases to take this on globally, is because the systems we rely on have to essentially be able to be built resilient uh, across multiple jurisdictions.
Hello, everybody. In Washington, there is much talk of a huge investment in infrastructure nationwide. To dramatically reform the nation's badly broken infrastructure. But in August of 2017, President Trump undid an Obama-era order that the federal government account for climate change as it designs public works projects. It's an act of recklessness, frankly. We are investing as taxpayer in these assets. We want them to be around their lifetime, their entire lifespan. And by the way, if it doesn't meet environmental safeguards, we're not going to approve it. Very simple. It may be reckless, and it may be so, human nature. This is, a, this is where scientists look to the humanities for answers. I ask historians this question, can we find examples in human history of, of a whole generation consciously doing something for the benefit of uh, more than one generation downstream that doesn't benefit that generation itself. It's very, very hard to find examples of that. I'm not sure we ever have. The experts who saw this storm coming say much more of this lies ahead, a time bomb for our children and grandchildren to defuse. In Boston, I'm Miles O'Brien for the PBS NewsHour. The Supreme Court heard arguments today in a case challenging the removal of hundreds of thousands of people from voter rolls in Ohio. In a moment, Jeffrey Brown will talk to Marsha Coyle of the National Law Journal about the questions the justices asked inside the court. But we begin with a report from Karen Kassler of PBS's Ohio station IdeaStream about what's at stake in the Buckeye State. U.S. Army Sergeant Joseph Helley was in Iraq in 2006 and 2007 and in Afghanistan in 2009. But when he came home to Ohio in 2011, he found a battle he didn't expect. Helley showed up to vote that fall and found his name had been removed from the voter rolls. I started crying. Uh, it was heartbreaking to be told that uh, one of those fundamental rights that you know, I put my life on the line for, raised my right hand for, uh, that I wasn't allowed to exercise it. I was protecting it for others, but others weren't able to protect it for me. Helly, who is now the mayor of Oak Harbor, a small village near Toledo, has joined the coalition of mostly progressive-leaning groups opposing the two-pronged approach Ohio has to maintaining its voter rolls. If a voter doesn't cast a ballot for two years, a postcard or mailer is sent to the address listed on the voter's registration. If the voter doesn't respond and then doesn't vote for another four years, the voter is removed from the voting rolls without further notice, whether the voter has moved or not. More than 4.6 million of those mailers have been sent to voters since 2011, the year Helly found out he was removed. At least hundreds of thousands of voters have been removed, but it's unclear exactly how many. Republican Secretary of State John Houston says the two-year window and the mailers are part of the state's legal obligation to remove the names of dead, imprisoned, or otherwise ineligible voters. It's us trying to say to the voter, gee, have you moved? Do you want to update your information? It's done to try to be helpful to the voter at helping them update their information and also to make sure that we maintain the voter rolls, which is another piece of the law. So you have, in the end, a six-year period to interact, uh, to vote, to let us know that you still want to be on the voter rolls. But those challenging the process say voting is not a use it or lose it right, and that voters can choose not to cast ballots because of illness, apathy, or other reasons, and not just because they've moved. Failing to vote and is a very poor proxy for someone moving. Close to 50% of Ohioans don't vote in every given election, but not close to 50% of Ohioans have moved. The number is much closer to, to 2%. So the secretary is purging vast numbers of completely eligible voters just to try to target a, a small, tiny handful of people who may have moved. But Houston says this method of voter roll maintenance has been in place in Ohio since 1994 with virtually no problems until the lawsuit was filed in 2016. This process has worked very well in Ohio under Democratic and Republican administrations. Nobody in Ohio has expressed problems with this. Uh, it's only out-of-state folks who seem to have trouble with how we're implementing the laws in Ohio. 
but the plaintiffs challenging the state, led by the AFL-CIO-affiliated A. Philip Randolph Institute, say they're doing so on behalf of Ohioans like Larry Harmon. The Northeast Ohio man is featured in a video produced by the ACLU, another plaintiff in the case. Harmon says that after several years of not voting, he discovered he'd been removed in 2015. That was the same year that many Ohioans who registered in 2008, when Barack Obama won the state, also found they had been erased from the rolls. The plaintiffs won an appeals court ruling that resulted in more than 7,500 ballots cast by voters who had been removed must be counted in the 2016 presidential election. Last August, the Justice Department under President Trump reversed the position it had taken under President Obama and filed a brief to support the state of Ohio's case. Seven states use a process similar to Ohio's, so potentially millions of voters will be affected by the court's decision. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Karen Kassler in Columbus, Ohio. Marsha Coyle covers the High Court for the National Law Journal, and she was in the courtroom, as always, as the justices grappled with this potentially far-reaching dispute. Marsha, so start with the argument against Ohio's uh, law. How was it made in, in court today? What, what were they looking What laws were they looking at? Okay, uh, really, there are two laws that are at the heart of the dispute here, the National Voter Registration Act and the Help America Vote Act, mm -hmm. which followed the National Act. Both were designed by, and intended by Congress to make voting easy and accessible. Mm -hmm. The challengers to Ohio's system, represented by Paul Smith today, argued basically the same argument that they had won in the lower court. Mm -hmm. Ohio Stay is... Stay with a winning argument. Absolutely. Huh? <laughs> Ohio is going wrong with its its system for removing voters from its registration rolls. So what kind of reception did they get from the justices? Well, I, I'd say the justices seem divided, but you never can really tell what's going on till the decision comes out. There was... To say that they're divided is, is not a surprise, <laughs> that's right? That's right. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. also the safe prediction, yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, Justices Kennedy and Breyer, for example, uh, they... Uh, they spoke to the concern that states have about maintaining the integrity of voter registration rolls. That is something that states have to do. Justice Breyer, for example, said, well, if you can't use the fact that a voter hasn't voted in two years to send out these notices, what can you do? Yeah. And Mr. So they're, in, they're in essence supporting the Ohio. Well, it sounds, sounding sounds like that way. I mean, yeah. I, they're raising one of the major concerns right. here yeah. of Ohio. And Mr. Smith said, well, you know, Ohio is really one of only eight states that uses the process that it uses. It's the most aggressive. There are other ways. I learned through this case that there is a national change of address database uh -huh. that <laughs> keeps track of changes of address that are sent to mm -hmm. postal offices. Yeah. And he said states can compare their registration addresses with that database. So there was this concern about how can states maintain integrity. And where did the challengers get their support from? Uh, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan, for example. Justice Sotomayor is concerned about what she said appears to be the disproportionate impact of Ohio's process on cities and neighborhoods that have a high percentage of uh, low-income workers who work odd shifts, have difficulty getting to the polls, uh, and also on minorities. She pointed out there have been a number of new voter restrictions put in place by states that create even more obstacles. Justice Kagan looked at Ohio's argument that, no, it's not the trigger the two-year trigger that removes voters, it's the failure to respond mm. to our confirmation notice mm. that removes voters. She looked at it and said, what it looks to me like is failure to vote, failure to respond, failure to vote. Yeah. And she didn't quite agree that it was the cause of the removal was the confirmation notice. So briefly, I mean, there's a lot on the docket for the court this year, this term yes, over voting rights and redistricting. But the, but the implication, political implications perhaps of this particular case? Well, as you probably know, Ohio is often a battleground <laughs> state do, yes. in national <laughs> elections. So the number of voters who are purged from the rolls yeah. could make a difference in a close election. Mm -hmm. So it's being close closely watched. And you're right, the court has two partisan gerrymandering cases. Mm -hmm. uh, it may well see another partisan gerrymandering case out of North Carolina. It continues to get racial gerrymandering mm -hmm. cases, voter ID. The whole land election landscape is alive right now with these types of cases. All right, this is all to be continued. Marsha Coyle, thank you as always. My pleasure, Jeff.
Now to a NewsHour share, something that caught our eye that we thought might be of interest to you. In Seattle, trail cameras in urban parks are giving researchers new insights into how coyotes, raccoons, and other carnivores are thriving in the harsh environment of big cities. From PBS station KCTS in Seattle, Eric Keto sent in this nocturnal story. We get some photographs that are just amazing, like the raccoons posing in front of a camera or, you know, the coyote at the water hole, all sorts of cool things. I'm Mark Jordan, uh, Associate Professor of Biology at Seattle University, and I am a conservation biologist. The big picture question I'm interested in is how does urbanization affect wild mammals, in particular predatory mammals that are higher up on the food chain? Is it that way? We'll try that way first. We're using camera traps to identify raccoons and opossums and coyotes in the parks in Seattle. Yeah, here it is. Understanding the wildness that surrounds us, I think, is very valuable for us, deepening our understanding of the natural world. 2,321 pictures. <laughs> From last summer, we have 50,000 photos to go through, and we put out a baited station. So we get about 100 to 150 hair samples. My students right now are working on a project where they're coming up with a genetic way to identify the species that left a hair sample to try to figure out how does urbanization affect their ability to move around the city. I would argue that the city is as much a natural area as what we call more wilderness areas. Now the physical environment itself has been changed, but the general rules of ecology still apply. The species out there are still interacting with each other. Now they're coming into interactions with us more frequently. And one of the really interesting insights has been as you increase urbanization, you actually get an increase in detections of raccoons. So within a square kilometer of Seattle, you might actually find more mammalian carnivores than you would in the same square kilometer out in the forest. We had gotten at least one photograph of a raccoon in every single park that we've sampled. Oh, I was missing a tail. There are a couple hypotheses. One is that in urban areas, things like mountain lions in particular are not competing with or eating raccoons. Also, of course, we have a lot of trash. We leave out food for our pets, all sorts of resources that these animals like. Any pocket park in a neighborhood, look for a big tree. Raccoons, you have kind of a daily commute, especially in the summer when the moms have their kits. You can hang out near the base of the tree and see them coming up and down. We create conditions for raccoons that tend to make them quite happy. Nature doesn't stop at the edge of the city. The things that go on in the dark of the night. And that's the news hour for tonight. Tomorrow, the latest on the deadly mudslides in California. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again right here tomorrow evening for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. watching PBS.